is this Ed? Yeah. All right. Well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited and very honored to welcome someone who you guys remember fondly as Lou Grant, possibly the most interesting boss that Mary Tyler Moore ever had. We're so excited to welcome Emmy Award winning actor, Mr. Ed Asner. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, big, big fan. Uh, I just want to say, Ed. Happy birthday, happy belated birthday. Uh, wow, I love the uh, photo that you did on Twitter where you're holding your middle finger up for your birthday. <laughs> well, that's the way I feel about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, Ed, you have an incredible career, but we wanted to kind of start this interview off by talking about a new film that just became available on video on demand as of November 8th and that is Boonville Redemption. Uh, oh, yeah. For our listeners who haven't had a chance to see it yet, although there's no excuse for that because it's available to them, uh, can you tell them a little bit about Boonville Redemption and your role in the film? Well, I kind of, uh, I'm like a um, drugstore cowboy without the drugstore. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on the street corner and I keep advising people as to what's good for them because uh, I'm uh, appreciative and um, eventually uh, things work out well for them and uh, I'm responsible of course Absolutely. I'm always doing these things about for humanity you know right right and uh, what was it like? I mean, the, the, the great thing about that film, uh, for our listeners who haven't had a chance to see it, this film had a fantastic cast. Not only had you, but also had uh, very well-known people like Diane Ladd and Pat Boone. What was it like being able to work uh, on the film with people who are, you know, consummate professionals like Pat and Diane? Well, it's nice to have Pat working uh, alongside you because he also produced the film. So, I wouldn't screw up. Uh, he had to be very nice to me while working with me. <laughs> be sure I didn't take revenge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it seems, Ed, that we're seeing a big change in, in programming. And back in the day, we had great family programming, like the Mary Tyler Moore show. And then TV and movies got really graphic and everything. And, and now there seems to be a popularity in these movies like the one you just did that we're talking about where it's more family based or oriented more based on yeah. faith or whatever. Do you think that's true that's going that way again? Yeah, I think, I, well I think it, it's, it's why Hallmark and Lifetime have um, enjoyed such responses from the audiences because they're getting product that uh, they used to get all the time but are denied that by the other production sources. Right, that's for sure. So at least Hallmark and Lifetime and whoever else may be out there, I don't know, uh, are making these products and making you feel good. And uh, particularly in this day and age, after this election, etc., people are dying to feel good. Yeah, definitely. Now that actually brings me to the questions. We've got a lot of listeners that, that put questions to us. And uh, I, I want to know how you felt about the outcome of the election when new presidential elect Donald Trump. I'm very disturbed by it. Uh, um, I, um, uh, particularly with the choices announced today about CIA and uh, and the security element and uh, the right wing element that is populating his administration yeah. and uh, I, I only know that uh, it ain't the American way and uh, I hope that uh, he gets enlightened well there you go I think it's great that, that people like you even at your age can, can still have opinions uh, the rumor was or is that you had a great show with, with Lou Grant, and that show was just as good as Mary Tyler Moore, but it was a whole different thing because it was seriousness and that. But a lot of people said it came to an end early because the network was afraid of your opinions and politics. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, it's a given. Yeah. Right. Um, and um, I uh, 
caused the cancellation of Lou Grant, and I'm happy to say that I understand that the third year of Lou Grant is now uh, being sold. Great. So, uh, we're slowly making our way back through the, the centuries of decline. Um, I um, made um, uh, Bill Paley the um, the head of CBS, mm-hmm. the owner, mm-hmm. unhappy by my thoughts on El Salvador and Nicaragua. And uh, uh, some sponsors dropped out. Kimberly Clark, who owned a couple of factories in El Salvador, mm-hmm. pulled out their sponsorship. But uh, I was assured by a vice president of CBS that other sponsors were standing in line waiting to take their place. Uh, sure. But uh, Bill Paley uh, didn't like my expressing opinions, so he had the show canceled. The, the show itself, were, were you really satisfied with it? Because I had heard that, that you guys were all concerned because people were used to Lou Grant being funny and it's a whole new direction. I mean, aside from being worried about it, once it was done, were you satisfied with the way it went? No, I thought we were. There was no other show like it. We tackled problems and we uh, presented problems, even with the minority view. And um, I, I think it was the cat's meow in terms of uniqueness. And um, I used to say there were three things that we didn't talk about. One was busing, <laughs> which was very big at the time. Right. Gun control, yeah. which is still big. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember what the third one was. Right. But uh, we discussed everything else. Yeah. And uh, it was healthy. Well, you had to have done something right because, I mean, you were one of the few actors to ever have played the same character in both a comedy and in a drama and won Emmys for both, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, I have to ask you, Ed, I had read that that you and Mary both have seven Emmys, and the only person that has more than you guys is also fellow cast member Cloris Leachman. Now, does she give you a hard time about that? Oh, she gives me a hard time in general. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to rub her out. (laughs) And, and then she'll be a non-contender. Right? <laughs> I, I'm real surprised. No, of course, but she's not just hitting on you because <laughs> I, I would think that, you know, she's kind of that way. Oh. But that's what makes we, it fun. We did get close to each other. Oh, there you and, go. And uh, she's hard to get close to because she has such a prominent bust. But uh, uh, she's a great gal. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And she is funny. And an improviser, and uh, wonderfully talented, and I love her to death. Yeah. See, that's the thing about the Mary Tyler Moore show. Of course, Mary was great and held it all together. But it's all you ensemble cast, a great ensemble cast. That's really what made it. If you look back at Mash and shows like that, that's really where those shows get successful is to have that ensemble cast like that. Yeah, yeah. So I um. I'm buddies with Mike Farrell, and uh, he certainly was a fortunate replacement to uh, come in and uh, take the place of Wayne. Right. But um, and he's gone on to do great things too in the social world. Thank God for him and his opinions. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to to hear that uh, his. Uh, planned uh, uh, act for the voters to vote on lost out on the death penalty. Yeah. 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 He'll have the death penalty. Now I want to... But maybe next time. Yeah. We'll get them next time. Right. Well, another question that came in from our audience, Ed, was uh, they were wanting us to ask you about uh, <clears throat> the relationship you had with actor Ted Knight, because of course the chemistry between your guys' characters on the show was incredible. Um, and you know, sadly, uh, we lost Ted back in the 80s. 
Uh, what was Ted like as a person off camera, and uh, what what was your guys' relationship off camera? He was um, the funniest man I ever knew. Always made me laugh. Kick the hell out of anything required of him in terms of comedy. And uh, uh, we had a parting of the ways when Lou Grant was canceled. Right. Uh, he, uh, he expressed his opinion about the show, and it was not flattering. So I, I had no other resort but to withdraw from Ted, but uh, as he lay dying, I went to see him, and hopefully, through the fog of, of dying, he, uh, he heard me, he saw me, and uh, knew that I still loved him and okay. appreciated him. That, that's great. That, 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 that's what I want to hear. That's, that's awesome. You know, I've got to mention... Uh, You've done great work in television, but you've also done some great movies. And I have a habit of bringing up little obscure films that sometimes <laughs> actors want to forget. And, and my favorite movie of yours you did was The Wrestler. Oh, my God. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you dirty dog. <laughs> now, why do you think that I think that's such a classic? Well, you saw all the wrestlers of the time. There you go. There you go. <laughs> in front of you, yeah. And uh, some of the funniest ones I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. They were funny. They knew how to entertain you, too. Yeah. They weren't as funny as Ted, but they were a close <laughs> second. Well, I don't know if it's fair that Terry says that that was his favorite movie, because I happen to know that a, one of his actual favorite movies is Change of Habit with oh, yeah. Elvis, Mary, yeah. and of course you. That's, uh, that was uh, Whoopi's uh, big intro into uh, a big film. Uh, change, wait, wait a minute. Change of Habit. I don't know, was that Whoopi? No, wait that I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. It was Mary. Yes. I think it was Leslie Uggams. I'm not sure. Okay. Leslie Uggams. Yes. And, um, oh, damn it. What was the young actress's name? She was in there, too. I can't remember. Um, but it was a, it was a, um, uh, the second of my two Elvis Presley films. Right, because you had worked on Kid Galahad, too, right? Yeah, yeah. And he was, a, he was a great, great pleasure to work with, let me tell you. You, you had a yeah. great chance to... He hit his marks, he knew his lines, right? and he didn't belch. <laughs> <laughs> you had a great chance to uh, observe him and how he felt about Hollywood because Kid Galahad was very early in the career, and then I heard Elvis got really disgusted with, with the movies they made him do as he was talking about how he would have to hit somebody and then sing to them. But once you got to change a habit, he got back to doing serious films again and how do you find the way Elvis felt about what he was doing uh, in Change of Habit from looking back at Kid Galahad? I mean, do you think he was happier? Or? Well, he, he, he was cooperative in both cases. In, uh, in Kid Galahad, he had an entourage mm -hmm. following him around, and he was in the middle of learning his karate at that time. So he had... Every every day there was another broken finger or something. <laughs> but uh, he uh, he never flinched, and uh, he did a good job. Right now, the same job in in uh, change of habit, but uh, he um, he didn't have the entourage. By that time, he had grown up. Right. Now, in uh, Change of Habit, uh, you were in there with not only Elvis and Mary Tyler Moore, but Barbara McNair, and then you worked with Barbara McNair again uh, for uh, the Mr. Tibbs movie, right? Oh, which movie? Uh, for, for Barbara McNair, you worked again with her for uh, They Call Me Mr. Tibbs. Uh, I'm Mr. Kidd. Uh, with Sidney Poitier and Barbara McCann. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was, um, uh, what was 
that's not the right title. The, the, um, I can't remember what the title is, Devin. <laughs> hey, don't um, feel bad. I hardly remember anything. <laughs> but, but he, um, uh, it was successful. Right. And, uh, and she was, as, as usual, lovely. Uh, I was just looking at Roots, the original Roots. Yes. Oh, yeah. She was in that, too. God, that was so iconic. I mean, that that, that, was, that was so big. And, and you talk about uh, women and being beautiful that you actually got to work with. Some woman that's not only beautiful but tough, and that is you worked with uh, Pam Greer in Fort Apache, the Bronx. Oh, God, what a, what, a, what a performance she gave in that movie. She was frighteningly beautiful. Yes. And she was good. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Now, I'm and a freewheeling tongue, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, in case people don't remember, uh, Ed, you were actually, you played Captain Thomas Davies in the original Roots uh, back in 1977. Um, did you have any idea at the time that you guys were making that, that it would be so important to American culture as what it turned out to be? No. No, I just didn't think of it at the time at all. I certainly came to realize it as it went on. It was uh, it was nice being in that adventure. Right. And did you, by chance, see the TV miniseries remake they did of it in 2016? Because we had some listeners that were asking if you saw it and what your thoughts of the remake were. I haven't seen it. Did you see it? I haven't seen it, no. Ah. <laughs> uh, Shame on you. Shame, shame. <laughs> we ought to drum you out of the core. <laughs> I saw the but, one uh, with you in it. That's enough. I, I, I couldn't even tell you the rumors I heard about it. <laughs> what have you heard about it? Um, I heard that it, it did fairly, it did okay. It did fair, but it didn't do as well as the original from 1977. Yeah. Well, it was interesting to me that in spite of the bad hair goods that I was draped in. <laughs> <laughs> that um, uh, the, the, prim the primitive conditions that we filmed it in, uh, that it came off looking as good as it did. And it was you know, such an honor that when we made it, that uh, Fred Silverman, the head of uh, ABC at that time, I uh, thought it was so good that he innovated the idea of showing it night after night. Uh, so that in a week the miniseries was completed. And um, uh, people loved that idea and they, they, the, the audience just grew and grew and grew. And it made history. Absolutely. Now I have to tell you, Ed, I, you make me feel lazy. Because I sit back and I look at your resume and I look at all of the projects that you have going on at once at your age and it makes me feel at my age like I haven't done shit with my life. So, <laughs> 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 I mean, you are keeping busy and just kind of uh, looking at your IMDB page right now. I mean, there must be probably about 19 projects that are listed as either uh, getting ready to air or in post-production. Um, lies, lies, all lies. <laughs> but I, I, under <laughs> I understand, unless it's wrong, in 2017 you have a film coming out called A Dog on Christmas where I believe for the sixth time you play Santa Claus? I think it's more than that. <laughs> but I'll, I'll take six. <laughs> um, uh, you can say Jewish boy makes good. <laughs> As Santa. Uh, so, uh, do you think... Well, I think it's more than six, but, uh, uh -huh. yeah, I, I do it again and again. Elf, of course, was the the big winner for Santa. Yeah. And uh, I'll always treasure that movie. John Favreau did a wonderful job. Will Ferrell was unbelievably great. Sure. Well, we hear you have a new Santa Claus movie coming out. Yeah, it's the one we just mentioned, A Dog on Christmas. Dog on Christmas. Uh, can you tell us anything about that? No, I, I um, well, yeah, I, I, we, we barely put that together. Mm -hmm. But um, 
it involves a um, a dog that gets swept up in the debris of Christmas, and uh, I don't know what to do. I, I guess uh, if I recall the ending for that movie, I think he becomes one of the one of the leaders of the uh, the reindeer mm-hmm. pack. Right. Uh, but you'll have to see it. You'll have to be provoked into seeing it <laughs> to see how good it is. Well, I wanted to ask you, I had read that you are still touring, and I believe uh, I had read that you have some dates coming up, uh, some nights coming up next year in uh, on the East Coast, but are you still yeah. touring with your one-man show, A Man and His Prostate? That's correct. <laughs> I certainly can help you fix yours. <laughs> So if somebody goes to see your one-man show, what are they in store for? Can you give everybody a little bit of a hint? A lot of laughs. Uh, Ed Weinberger wrote the script. It's based on his own personal encounter, the prostatitis. And uh, it's funny. It's really funny. Uh, it's both funny and it's instructive. There you well, go. There you go. And, and, you, and you know I can't wait for Christmas to begin because one of my, you may not even remember this, one of my favorite audio things you ever did is you did a reading of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Ranger for Montgomery Woods. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's classic stuff. If you really were Santa Claus, would you be the, the happy Santa Claus we know or would you be your usual sometimes cantankerous, cantankerous uh, sub? What do you think is better for the kids? What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know, do you? He doesn't, no. He, he just shrank in his chair, Ed. <laughs> yes, I just put you on the naughty list, boy. <laughs> uh, another question from our audience, Ed. Um, somebody was asking uh, what affiliation, if any, you had had with Second City in the early days of your career. Well, the theater that I started with in Chicago... Uh, Playwrights Theater Club eventually folded, and but out of those ashes, David Shepard and Paul Sills uh, decided to go into a form of theater which contained more improv, and that was uh, um, now I can't think of it. Um, uh, I can't remember the name. Mm-hmm. It was a uh, an improv theater. We did that for several years, and that folded. Paul went legit for a year in Chicago, managing the Studebaker Theater. Then he came back with uh, his ideas for the Second City, which probably was the first effective improv theater in the country, and. Um, when they had their 25th uh, reunion on television, knowing that I had been there at the beginning, they invited me to participate in one of their skits, and I became a, an um, ex officio member of Second City. Wow. And I would say that if they ever create a pantheon of, uh, what should I say, of gods of the theater, mm-hmm. American theater, if Paul Sills isn't Zeus, then it's uh, a faulty uh, <laughs> creation. <laughs> right. There you he go. He certainly is more responsible by his creation in Second City. Uh, oh, the Compass was the name of that other theater. Ah, yes. Preliminary theater. But Paul Sills is more responsible for the creation of more actors. Saturday Night Live certainly should tell yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, than anybody else in this country. And uh, at the same time, um, the benefit to theater in general, uh, the actors generated by his uh, formations. Right. Now, Perfect. Hello, hello. Did I wake you no, up? No, no, no. We're here. I was, I was waiting until you were done. 
I go ahead. I, I've got to ask you because got so many great credits as as we're getting close here. Uh, of course, I was amazed that you were in the Outer Limits and stuff like that in the original. But probably the weirdest credit I've seen because I know the show, the Dr. Susan Block show, <laughs> which is all about sex and, and, and all that. And what did you do on that show? What are you talking about? <laughs> Well, you were on a, a cable access show called Dr. Susan Block. Where well, at least he was listed as such on IMDb. Maybe it's wrong. Yeah, it might, I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> it could be my faulty, aged memory. Oh. Well, I or thought... it could be something I don't want to remember. Or yeah, <laughs> I, I thought maybe you were, you were on there with some young girl and just don't want to tell nobody about it. Oh, and it is a ladies' man, so... <laughs> I was maybe on the show with her, and maybe I was off the show with her. <laughs> <laughs> um, another another question, uh, really quick, that we got in Ed uh, from a listeners is they said, uh, "Please tell Ed that I not only love his work, but I also am a huge admirer of his politics, his charity work, and how opinionated he is without any fear of saying it like it is." Can you ask Ed what his opinion is of the merger of SAG and AFTRA? I have not been happy with that merger. I fought it. Uh, and um, I, um, I I don't think the actors of SAG have been uh, properly treated in terms of the merger. There have, uh, have not been a proper resolution of um, the health benefits, mm-hmm. pension benefits, not a proper collegiality has gone on there. And until it does, I will always be opposed to it. Right, right. Now, um, I, I wanted to ask just really quick if you could tell our listeners a little bit about, and it's kind of going back to the beginning, but how you kind of got started in the business because you weren't like a lot of uh, actors that come here when they're, 16 and they have you know stars in their eyes and they think they're going to become famous uh when you came to hollywood you're actually already an adult and married right oh oh, yeah but i i certainly was involved in theater before i came to hollywood i uh i first acted uh in form of commitment uh while i was at the university of chicago It was during the summer and I decided to try out for a a play at the urging of my roommate. And I ended up doing the lead. It was T.S. Eliot's Murder in the Cathedral. Mm -hmm. It's such a great poetical drama, I got hooked. From then on, well, I actually also, I, I started an affair with a lady in the chorus. I was kind of double hooked. <laughs> that does help. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. And um, that started me trying out for all the plays in the university theater and in its uh, competitor at the university tonight at eight thirty. Mm-hmm. I did plays at both, and uh, finally dropped out of college because of my attachment to theater mm-hmm. and uh, realized I was going to dedicate myself to theater no matter what it took. So I performed working jobs, worked in the steel mills in Gary and the auto plants in Chicago and uh, supported myself until Finally, I went to New York, and um, now, first I got drafted. Right, right. While I was in the Army, I got a letter from Paul Sills just before I left France saying, uh, will you come join us in Chicago? We're going to do old classics and new plays, and you'll enjoy yourself. And I did. And for two years, I got great reviews at the Playwrights Theater Club. And uh, finally it folded and Paul and David wanted to do more of the improv. I thought that's not a legitimate way to make a living. (laughs) (laughs) 
So uh, I went to New York with my clippings. Right. Spent six years in New York, and then finally um, came to California to do a naked city. Wow. Wow. That's it. Yeah. But you know, a good person to ask this question of is you, because you're, you're been around so long and. At your age, you're so active and, and doing don't so many have great to, uh, You don't have to make your voice quaver <laughs> you say how long I've been around. <laughs> but, but, you know, the thing is, is, is you yes. really, you, you really are an intelligent <laughs> person. Yes. And, and, you know, as, as there's a lot of ageism in Hollywood, and even at only 60, I get that myself. Uh, especially, uh-huh. especially with your act, a lot of times where you're grumpy and this and that. Do people ever worry about you not being as with it as you are? Because you are so with it and so smart. Do people worry about your age? You can't do it, or they try to say, "Oh well, he, he's a little you know, old or a little senile," whatever. Which is not true for you. No, no, it's not true. I, uh, thank God, my my brain is still clicking. Uh, I'm slower. I'm I'm not as swift as I used to be. So are we. But I'm freer. <laughs> Yeah. Right. That makes for the slowness. Um, and uh, if they do feel that way, they don't tell me uh, uh, and or they don't hire me. Yeah. But they don't know their ass from a hole in the That's right. No, they don't. I was going to say, if they, if they do feel that way, fuck them. You don't need That's them right. anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me look at them first. <laughs> If I ever, if I ever get somebody giving me a hard time with ageism, I'm gonna go get you and Rickles, <laughs> and you guys are gonna help me out, and you're gonna like, like kick some ass or something, and they'll take care of it. Well, the last last thing before we go, Ed, is I did want to uh, mention really quick and and uh, ask if there was anything that you could share with our listeners as to how they can help out, because I know that you do work with a lot of charities, um, and you do work with a lot of uh, autism charities, and are there any uh, fundraisers or events or anything like that that's coming up that you can let our listeners know about where they could actually participate and or donate to try to help the cause? Well, I I wish I had dates. I I don't. My son has just uh, recently become vice president of the Autism Society. He was with Autism Speaks and has left that organization to join the Autism Society. And uh, they're both great groups, and uh, uh, the Autism Society will be sponsoring its, uh, its annual walks and its, its, uh, its gift giving. And I have an autistic son who um, uh, about a couple of years ago, got his uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Southern Connecticut. Mm-hmm. They'll be going on for a master's. Good for him. So it's um, uh, autism is a good thing to become acquainted with because it has a wide spectrum. Right. And uh, the the habitual uh, uh, or the the, uh, the victim may be difficult to deal with socially, but they have a great deal to offer mentally. Yes. Right. As long as you get to know them. Absolutely. I contribute to that organization, and I, I'm on the board of Defenders of Wildlife. Uh, I have great fears that the new administration is going to be lax in preserving the environment. Particularly those northern Midwest states mm-hmm. in killing of wolves. They like to kill wolves. And it's a disappearing breed. Right. And I have I to... I have only to recommend you, you investigate uh, the Defenders of Wildlife. Yes. And I uh, have to... Other than that, uh, people know how to pick charities better than I do. Right. Uh, I won't go beyond that. Yeah, Defenders of Wildlife is a great organization. I have to ask you uh, a personal question. Have you, are you familiar with uh, the Shadowland Wolf Sanctuary in Southern California? I, I'm not. I'm no. I'm not aware of it. Um, Where is it? It's. Uh, it is uh, a little bit north of Hollywood, kind of in uh, the the lower hill parts, uh, just past Santa Clarita Valley. 
Oh, really? Yeah, and the reason I was asking Oops is because they are also, you know, very up on, you know, trying to to make sure that legislation passes to protect wolves and the the, oh. the saving of them and things like that. And they actually have a, uh, a area where you can where people can go and meet wolves. They have a pack of wolves that lives on their property that's that's that you wonderful. can go and meet. And I just thought that if you haven't but been, you might want to go. <laughs> Kidding. Yeah. Well, uh, there's also actors and others for animals. Yes. They do a great job uh, taking care of all animals. Um, and um, I, I'm going to have to look up what's the name of that organization of yours? They're called Shadowland. I'm going to look for it. Yeah. Shadowland Wolf Sanctuary. Um, you, you're welcome. Uh, well, Ed, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I encourage our listeners, uh, if you haven't seen uh, the new film that we were talking about at the opening of this interview, which is Boonville Redemption, you want to make sure to check it out. It's available on DVD and video on demand as of November 8th, starring Diane Ladd, Pat Boone, and Ed Asner. I'd like to yep. give you uh, yep. one last chance to, to give an opinion here, and then we'll, we'll really say goodbye this time. It's been such a I great honor having you on. I'm calling you to that. <laughs> and, yes, and, yes. And, and, please, please, deliver yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, you know, with uh, President Trump now being President Trump, and whether we like it or not, I mean, he's our president for the next four years. What is your advice for President Trump, and what would you like to wish the world for hopefully a better future? Well, I hope he moves very slowly. Mm -hmm. I hope he doesn't lean totally over to the right as he has threatened to do. I hope he stops this caca about branding Muslims, mm -hmm. which is a noble religion and uh, which has any law, most of its uh, parishioners are law-abiding and peaceful. Um, we can't brand Muslims with the brand of ISIS and ISIL yeah. or Taliban. Right. Uh, they are free of that, and I'm sure that they celebrate that freedom, and we should do, treat them nobly. We should treat them like any other religion until they break the law. Yes. Right. Then lower the roof. Exactly. But then uh, I, uh, I certainly hope he doesn't do anything in terms of abortion, as he's threatened to do. I hope he doesn't do anything in terms of building any kind of wall. Maybe he should build a three-foot wall. <laughs> Maybe that'll satisfy him. Uh, what else? And, and what about your hope for the world in this coming holiday season? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the election has stunned Europe as much as it stunned us. Right. And I hope that we bear it out proudly, nobly, and and do our best to keep an even keel, to offset any aberrations that President Trump might perform. He's got some bad guys working for him, and hopefully we'll survive them too. Right. And if all else fails, I say Ed Asner for president. I, think, I think you would make a good president. Yeah. You really Plus, would. you know, a vote for Ed Asner is a vote for Santa Claus, so... <laughs> oh, that's something, isn't it? <laughs> wow. All right, I'm printing up the flyers as you speak. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is such an honor to have uh, a, such a legend, and you're so humble considering how much gold you have with all your awards and everything. I mean, literally, <laughs> you, you have as much gold as Elvis Presley had. But, wow. Like what the only place I got gold is on the awards. <laughs> <laughs> got to find a way to melt it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ed, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. It has been such an honor to chat with you, and we wish you the best of luck. Not that you need it, but the best of luck with continuing with your career, and uh, we hope to see many, many, many more things from you in the years coming forward. You two are a pair I would not draw to. <laughs> <laughs> I love you both. We love, love you, too. you too, Ed. Have a great holiday season that's coming up. And the same to you and to all of your parishioners. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. You've made it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yay. <laughs> all, right. all right. All right. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you, Ed. My pleasure. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>